everybody. Welcome to this session. It's a great uh, honor and uh, really a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to have here today representatives of the Aspen Institute Kiev and uh, uh, an event uh, hosted by Aspen Institute Romania. Of course, the topic which we are going to debate is um, Ukraine and uh, what, what and um, what the consequences for, for leadership in such a difficult period would be, what would be uh, the measures and the outlook for uh, rebuilding and ensuring the resilience of Ukraine. And of course, we are going to focus on deep human values and what everybody of us can or should do in such difficult period. What we in Ukraine uh, are experiencing now is a war of, the war of our independence, of, it's the fight for our existence, but also that the fight for uh, Europe's peace and global freedom. It's a fight for values. And uh, many of those who had Aspen experience, they know that biggest part of our mission as Aspen Institutes is to promote value-based leadership. Leadership which is based on values. And at Aspen, we always understand values as not as some declarations, but we do believe that values are our actions, that the way how we act and which decisions we take. So I do believe that like February 24th was a big day for the whole world to go through the test of values and to really show uh, by actions which values we are fighting for, we believe for and uh, uh, we live for. We in Aspen stand for value-based leadership. But what is leadership today? Leadership today is caring and doing together. Standing together for our values, standing together for our ability to be human. This is what we are militating for. This is what we stand for together and also very coherent and very consistent to Aspen mission. It is probably our painful duty these days to think about the day of tomorrow and think how we can actually build societies driven by values. How are we going to be able to influence a different way of being going forward. We have lost almost half of our economy right now. And those are, of course, are the bad news because the war is still going. I have all the figures of how, how many people, how many companies started, stopped working and what is going on. But the, the overall picture is that it's looking very bad. It's the devastating war. And obviously, it is still going. It will be worse. As I said, 13% of the territory are mined. 40% uh, of companies, approximately 39 41% have stopped working and we are trying right now to recover them. Uh, we have done a big plan to actually move the companies to um, the west of Ukraine and to other countries. We have had exactly 860 um, de demands, like electronic demands uh, registered by companies who want to relocate and we are relocating them for free by the Ukrainian railway, by the Ukrainian postal service, etc., etc. But of course, this is not enough. So we have had damages on it, we estimate more than one trillion, some estimate over two trillion right now, and they are still ongoing. So this is something that which no Marshall Plan, no Brussels, Brussels Plan will ever be able to get in terms of numbers. Obviously, we want investments. Obviously, we need, you know, partnerships. First, uh, we do need a single market and we are working for it. Second, I believe, and this is something maybe not very popular for me to say, but I will, I believe that we should have the uh, there accession to you first and the complete integration to you second. So how do we secure that this goes forward? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think that we have any other choice. We were told on the first three days of war that we will have a government in exile uh, by the end of the first week, that we will have a parliament ex in exile. And a number of ambassadors from all over the world called me and told me that they have an apartment for me in Warsaw or in Krakow, whatever I want, because there would be a parliament in Warsaw or Krakow or Zheshev at the, at the, at the latest. Um, this did not happen. And this did not happen because we did not 
subject ourselves to fear, but we moved, you know, one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. We protected Bucha first, then Gostomel, then Kiev. Kiev was under attack for at least three weeks, and there was a big possibility that Kiev would be a smaller twice the size that it is right now, and it always was. We could have lost a number of times the left bank of Kiev, I can tell you that honestly now. And we would be left with just the right bank on the river Dnipro. This did not happen because we moved one step by step by step. So I'm sure that in this situation, we also need to move one step by step. We take the first step. The first step is a single market to the EU and export of our companies and relocating our companies. We have started to do that. The second step would be candidacy. And the third step would be to produce this kind of Brussels plan and Marshall plan together and integrate them with specific details for specific industries, for specific companies, for specific cooperation agreements. Third, we will work on their uh, acceptance of our membership to the European Union. It will take a year, probably more. I am very optimistic. I think it could be a year. And then we work at the needed reforms that we are able to work after the war is over, or at least not as aggressive as it is right now from the Russian Federation. We also need to start thinking and planning rebuilding. Rebuilding Ukraine is going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars, if not close to a trillion in my estimate. And I think that when we look at the Marshall Plan, it is a plan that was really only in today's dollars, $115 billion. And the Marshall Plan really was not about rebuilding. It was really about re-energizing and, and, and providing dollars into the European economies and getting Europe to trade and to be a, a, a more cohesive economy. This is going to be the largest rebuilding that the world has ever seen to date. This is gonna be larger than Kuwait after the Iraqi war or Afghanistan, larger than what I've lived through here in Puerto Rico, after a hurricane, Hurricane Maria in 2017, we had $100 billion in damage. And Puerto Rico is 166 the size of Ukraine. So we are literally talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. The one thing that we can do right now is legislate to take the frozen assets of the Central Bank of Russia and any other sanctioned entities and set them aside as the core as the very base of that rebuilding campaign. We've frozen approximately 300 billion in central bank reserves and another 100 billion globally in other oligarch and sanctioned entities. That money should serve at the core and then bilateral, multilateral, and very importantly, private sector money has to come in in an organized coordinated fashion to rebuild Ukraine once we prevail in the war. There is no single party that can be responsible for the rebuilding. It's too large, as I said earlier. And uh, I believe that we need to really expand uh, the parties that are a part of that rebuilding effort from the, fo from the focus of sourcing the amount of money that's necessary. So the EU should be an enormous part of it, but so should the United States, Canada, Japan. And I think we need to move beyond the G7 to the G20, frankly. Um, as well as what, what the alphabet soup that we always look towards, the IMF, the World Bank, the EBRD, the EIB, and others. I think that there will have to be a single point of coordination on the donor side. And I use the word donor because I really believe this needs to be almost entirely grant oriented to the maximum extent possible. Again, I think that the core of it needs to be Russian frozen assets. So the core of, the, of, of any rebuilding fund needs to come from Russian assets. I believe there should also be an ongoing Russian reparation, whether it's a tax on oil and gas sales in the future or some other constant um, source of, of, of revenue for this fund. But yes, Ukraine has to have its own coordination uh, agency on the other side. I think the critical issue from, from the donor side is going to be having confidence in the plan of rebuilding, one. And so that is on the Ukrainian side, for sure. They need to provide a plan. You're not going to rebuild everything that was destroyed. You're going to rebuild better. I think the second element that the donors are going to want confidence in is that the monies are going to be used appropriately as they are intended. And I think that is based on procurement. And I think that we need to have a single procurement uh, system that is transparent, that is repeatedly and constantly audited and reviewed, and that the donors can have confidence in it, and yet it does not slow down 
what should be uh, a very urgent rebuilding process. As a country that has gone through this uh, process of accession to the European Union, but also after the accession, it wasn't, the integration did not happen the second day. Uh, and some reforms are necessary. And I'm, I'm coming from, from a country that even though has been a member of the European Union for 15 years, we still have the mechanism, the CVM. Uh, when in practical terms, when it comes to the European Union and, and joining uh, uh, the European family, there are a number of, of rules and, and, and a set of values that we all have to share. Uh, it's frustrating. It's extremely frustrating for Romania to be a member of the European Union for 15 years and, and still be part of the CVM and, and still not be part of Schengen. But these things do happen. We have understood that there are things that we need to improve at, at the level of, of Romania, but we do understand that uh, some decisions uh, are more complicated. This does not mean that or either Romania or the European Union will not stand with Ukraine. We do stand with Ukraine. We do understand that it's not only your fight against the Russian Federation. We do understand that it's our, our fight against the Russian Federation. But we have to be extremely, um, extremely conscious that there is uh, a there is this need of, of understanding each other better and of understanding that indeed confidence and trust is going to be gained and is going to be built in time. We also have to be extremely careful about the disinformation and about the fake news. Also Romania and other European countries are going through very difficult economic times. And we also have to be extremely careful to the vulnerabilities and sensitivities of, of the Romanian people and of, of, of people from the EU because I'm convinced and I can see from, from what's going on in the social media that the Russians will try to create this, this tension between helping Ukraine and helping the people that are in vulnerable uh, categories in Romania and in other countries. And we have to be very careful not to allow them to build on that uh, because we don't, our goal is, is, is that you and us together can go through this and, and be stronger after this, but we have to be very careful, including with our pu public statements about the dissensitivities. It's, it's, the war unfortunately has different, different faces and disinformation and fake news is, is, one, is one of them. Now, everyone in Europe understands that we can only live in safety and security within the borders of NATO and within the borders of the 27 member states of the European Union if we are surrounded by countries which are safe and stable. Everyone understands that uh, defending Ukraine means defending ourselves. We need to make sure that the unity uh, of the EU prevails and people should understand that for as long as there will be an autocratic regime in Russia, Russia will be a threat for the security of Europe, of each of our countries. Because autocratic regimes in Russia need enemies, they need wars to justify their existence. So they will be imperialistic, they will be, they will be aggressive. So we need to stay united. And in order for people to, um, in order to keep this unity, we have to make sure that people are properly informed about the dangers, the threats coming from Russia, tackling fake news, disinformation, propaganda. Ukraine needs a Marshall-like plan. Um, we shall do it. Doing it does not only mean that we help Ukraine, but it means that we help ourselves because if Ukraine is stable, if we create a perspective of prosperity there, it means that there will also be stability in Romania and other member states of the European Union. So yes, we should do it. Yes, the institutions of the European Union are already thinking of it. They are ready to, um, to take the leading role, but we have to be honest and transparent. The European Union alone will not be able to fund this. The European Union 
um, can use its expertise, its tools, its mechanisms um, to create the framework. It will provide part of the funding as well, but it will have to be everyone around. Uh, public money, but we should also try to trigger as much private investment as possible. And in order for private investment to find Ukraine attractive, letting Ukraine join the single market is one thing which would be very, very useful. Secondly, of course, it will be reforming Ukraine, reducing cutting, uh, cutting red tape, reducing bureaucracy, all of those measures. Um, uh, strengthening the rule of law, um, improving the competitiveness of the economy. Um, so all of these reforms, once the war is over, we have to help Ukraine do so that they become attractive for, uh, for investments. Mm -hmm.